could relegate us to the status of a second class space power and cede global leadership to the People's Republic of China. Recent space system acquisition reform proposals by the Air Force and Space Force hold great promise that success is only possible through a genuine partnership between the US government and the private sector. And that's what the association seeks, a strong and vibrant partnership between industry and government. Along these lines, some of you may have seen the recent report released by this Association Studies and Analysis Center entitled Acquiring Space Capabilities with Agility and Discipline at the Speed of Relevance. The report can be found on the association's website, which is www.nssaspace.org. Again, that's www.nssaspace.org. The report contains 16 principles to guide ongoing efforts to reform and modernize the process by which national security space systems are acquired. If you hadn't read the report, please take a look. It's chock full of insightful analysis and actionable recommendations. In addition, as many of you know, in May, the Air Force submitted a report to, con to Congress outlining an alternative acquisition system for the US Space Force. That report was subsequently withdrawn, but it has garnered significant attention for its proposals for reforming and modernizing national security space acquisition processes and structures. To discuss these two reports and space acquisition reform more broadly, we're absolutely delighted to have with us today a diverse panel of distinguished experts in the field of national security space system acquisition. And thanks very much to each of our participants today. Before introducing our speakers, I have a couple of administrative details. The event is scheduled to go until 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we'll wrap up promptly at 1 p.m. For our viewers, you'll be muted the entire session. That being said, if you have questions for the speakers, please submit them online uh, using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring the questions as we go along, and depending on time availability, we'll, uh, we'll uh, select this question or, or two or three to our panelists towards the end of the discussion. Again, we're glad that you've joined us and encourage your questions and participation. Now on to our speakers. We're delighted to have with us a distinguished group of national security practitioners true experts in the field of space system acquisition. All have played central roles in developing, acquiring, and fielding systems and capabilities that are critical to our nation's security. Truly, they've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in space acquisition. General Ellen Polakowski, U.S. Air Force retire retired, served as Commander, U.S. Air Force Materiel Command. During her distinguished career, she served in key acquisition positions in the Air Force and at the National Reconnaissance Office. Ellen, welcome. Uh, Jeffrey Harris served simultaneously as Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space and Director of the National Reconnaissance Office. Jeff, thanks so much for being here. Colonel Doug Lavero, U.S. Air Force retired, served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy and has held key positions in space acquisition in several U.S. government organizations. Doug, welcome. Major General Don Hard, U.S. Air Force retired, served as Director of Space Programs in the Office of the Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, Don, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you. And Mr. Tom Conroy served for over three decades as a program manager for many technical collection and special communications programs executed by the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office. Glad you could join us this morning, Tom. I should note that each of these distinguished individuals serves on the Board of Advisors of the National Security Space Association. Thanks to each of you for your time and efforts in that capacity. We're, we're glad to have you. With that, I'll begin the questioning. And this question is for each of our distinguished panelists. You've seen both the National Security Space Association Studies and Analysis Center the report that lays out key principles for guiding space system acquisition reform and modernization, as well as the Air Force report to Congress laying out alternative acquisitions uh, processes for the US Space Force. What's your overall assessment of these two reports? Were there particular recommendations that you found especially timely and important? And if so, which ones and why? And we'll start with, uh, with General Polakowski. Ellen, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Chris. Thanks so much for this opportunity to participate in this forum. And uh, it was a great forcing function for me to go back and look at both the report and the NSSA recommendations and, and kind of put some thought into what, what I saw as the, the key aspects of uh, space acquisition as we go forward. 
So to start out, in my view, whether it has been my experience in space acquisition or in my broader experience in the Air Force acquisition, Department of Defense acquisition, there are really what I call three key characteristics of an, of an approach to uh, acquiring new capability uh, that are the key to success. And this is built on uh, my experience with working with organizations like the RCO, the Rapid Capabilities Office, or and the National Reconnaissance Office, and, and so many others. And they, these three characteristics are what I call, um, uh, in general, godlike authority for the team that's working it. And I, you know, I use that term broadly, but basically it's the authority to be able to make decisions and move forward in a rapid way. The second is a small team of talented people that's kind of key to the first one, because if you don't have talented people, um, you're going to make bad decisions. And I don't care how good your authorities are if you make bad decisions. And then the third one is what I call unlimited resources, meaning that any uh, many times I've seen programs fail because they were trying to do too much with not enough money. And so though and, and without sufficient resources and dollars, you can't manage risk. So now keeping those three characteristics in mind, if you look at the Air Force report to start, a good portion of the Air Force uh, recommendations going forward, whether they're the ones for con which require congressional action or the ones that can be done inside the DOD are focused on that first one, godlike authority. In fact, um, uh, uh, three of the, the top eight things are directly on that. Streamlining requirements validation, accelerating decision speed, and accelerating contracting speed, all of which are based on having the authority to make decisions. But I think within the, the specific unique things that are talked about there, there are three uh, out of the roughly eight that I flagged that were under this that I think are particularly important when we look to the future. One is a unique acquisition thresholds and milestone decision authority for space. And this is key to being able to get that balance between having the authority, but also maintaining the trust. And this gets into the issue of not everything can be special. And so by establishing acquisition thresholds and milestone decision authority, uh, and then the second one along those lines, new policy regarding key decision points, there can be a good balance between that godlike authority and the trust that has to come from overseers such as Congress and the Department of Defense. And then the last of those three that I identified in there was a modified JSIDS approach. And why I say that's important is particularly for space systems. So many of the requirements that come into space systems are not controlled by the space community. Communications, navigation, and this external pull on requirements can be very destabilizing to the authority of the team. The second area of small talented teams, this is where the space, uh, the Air Force report kind of falls short. It only has a broad discussion of enhancing the human capital development, and then of course, better alignment with the NRO. And having spent three years at the, two and a half years at the NRO, uh, as well as out, you know, at, in addition to my years out in LA, I believe that this is a really critical thing is to have good alignment when it comes to talent management with the NRO uh, and, and enhancing the human capital. In contrast, the NSSA uh, report is very heavy in this area and there are a number of good recommendations here uh, that deal with um, particularly the area of creating a deeper industry government partnership. And I think that many of the recommendations that are in the NSSA report focus on this area. And that's one that the Air Force report doesn't necessarily speak much to, except in terms of the contracting. And then finally, the unlimited resources. This is key to uh, a number of the things that are in the Air Force report. But I think the most important of these is maximizing the budget execution, flexibility, and efficiency. And the particular recommendation there is the budget line item restructure, giving the community the opportunity to apply the resources in the right places without having these uh, bureaucratic lines 
that block the ability to move agilely in that area. Uh, again, the NSSA report has a number of good recommendations, um, the most of which I think is this uh, maintaining an unrelenting focus on mission success. The unlimited resources is sometimes because we have so many things that um, pull on the resources that aren't necessarily that which is focused on the mission success. So in my mind, that's a real key aspect. And then final uh, recommendation out of the Air Force report is the unique uh, US Space Force head of contracting authority. So if you look at the spectrum of, of decisions that have to be made in a program, they go to the requirement side, which is addressed in the JSIDs, but all the way down to the day-to-day -day execution, and that's in the contracting um, authority. So that in separate contracting authority, I think is a critical aspect of being able to execute successfully, and it gets right at this issue of a deeper industry government partnership as well. So that's in a nutshell what I see as the critical aspects of these two and how it feeds into having successful space acquisitions as we move forward. That's a great summary. Thank you. You've touched on a number of important issues and we'll double back on some of those, uh, Ellen, in, in the questions and follow up. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Jeff Harris. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. And thanks to the National Security Space Association for leadership on this important topic. Uh, it's a topic we've studied uh, at length uh, throughout my career. And um, again, space capability and space competency is important uh, with the US as the global leader. And it's important for us all to get this right. Uh, I am very pleased, as General Palachowski pointed out, that we have the attention and the focus of both the administration and Congress. And there will be uh, the necessary sparring to get to the right conversation to get this right. But the big headline here around acquisition reform is we need to go back to basics. Time is money and time is the key measure to relevance. Uh, General Hart and I were discussing Corona uh, as we were coming online today. And uh, I'm reminded of Battle's Law. Lee Battle was the program uh, manager for Corona. Uh, and, and you recall that uh, President Eisenhower knew the importance of space and knew the importance of understanding the missile and the bomber gap. And he worked hard the organization because we had organizations that were not working as efficiently as possible. And the skills that Ellen spoke of uh, needed to be coalesced uh, in order to get the right people in the right job at the right time. And, and the history books will tell us that from the time Francis Gary Powers uh, was shot down to the first successful recovery of imagery from Corona was some 100, 108 days. Uh, and, and, and so the country was in sort of the right place at the right time. You know, I, I'm reminded by, by Battle's Laws. And so here's a document from 1960. And of his 10 laws, uh, there are five of them I'll just quickly highlight. Keep the program office small and quick reacting at all costs. Exercise extreme care in selecting people, then heavily rely on their personal abilities. Cut out all unnecessary paperwork. Hit all flight and checkout failures hard. A fault uncorrected now will come back to haunt you. Uh, re rely strongly on contractor technical recommendations. And don't over communicate with higher headquarters. Um, and, and, and so this formed the fabric of, of what it took to get all the things moving together. And as you recall, the Corona program where it had multiple failures in a row, which we've uh, admired over the years is something that would be bureaucratically difficult today. Um, they, they were successful uh, in, in a short period of time by, by being able to learn from their mistakes and not just observing the mistakes. So, um, it makes no sense to have an agile development in a burdensome process bound acquisition system. So back to Chris's question, the legislative proposals contain some very noteworthy items. Uh, budget portfolio, but moving to budget portfolios that encompass 
similar budget line items can provide the important visibility uh, to our colleagues on, on Capitol Hill uh, and the flexibility for the program manager to execute. Um, I, I recall uh, a program acquisition a number of years ago where um, there was some ground hardware that needed to be bought and the provider of the hardware was about to introduce some new capability, which was going to cause some significant discounting uh, of the hardware. Uh, and the program manager says, the older hardware meet, totally meets my requirements and meets my need, and had to purchase the hardware 45 days early in order to meet his expenditure profile and couldn't get the 40% price reduction uh, in order to meet the mission need. And, and, and so the well-intended budget system said, we'd rather have you spend more money on time than less money. Uh, and, and so the fungibility of the money, uh, uh, plus or minus 45 day in a four or five year acquisition cycle um, is, is, is clearly something you know, we want to entrust with the program manager. So the budget portfolios allow the lanes in the road to be established uh, between the program manager, uh, his leadership, his or her leadership, uh, and the Congress. The milestone reviews, um, the acquisition, um, man, the, the acquisition um, literature came out of the Pentagon uh, when I was in the Pentagon, and I was reading it early one morning, and uh, the first ACOT-1 program had gone through the system. And to get to milestone one was an 18-month process. And the woman that wrote this report sort of said, you know, we ran this process about as efficiently as it could possibly run. And so we're really pleased that it took us 18 months. And now we have users demanding several week turnaround and capability from the field. And, and, and so I've mixed the metaphor between sort of an ACAT-1 program and the kind of user responsiveness. But, but, but when we look at the kind of features that we want our systems to provide, milestone reviews have to be consistent uh, with all of that. And consistent with that, uh, tailored uh, program acquisition regulations, the DFARS, remember they're only regulations, uh, they, should, they should be and can be tailored. Uh, most programs can find uh, a straightforward way through the DFARS and not celebrate a bunch of unnecessary bureaucracy. And, and so uh, to reinforce what General Palachowski said, we need to recognize the importance of skills and organization and culture. Uh, I was having a conversation um, with John Hyten uh, a few years ago, and he said, you know, we don't always allow our program managers to be program managers. They do everything but manage the program. Um, we need program managers, this is me speaking now, to be resourced, held responsible, uh, and held uh, accountable. So they need to have the responsibility to make the decisions and the responsibility to live with those decisions. And they gotta work in an organization that's outcome driven, where the people in the organization have aligned incentives and we're focused on the output, which is the mission output, not the inputs or the collection of artifacts. And the mission focus across the organization must overcome bureaucratic imperatives. Um, what I've noticed over the last 20 years is the support functions have become entities into themselves, and they no longer support the program manager directly. So legal, contracting, fiscal, all important skills, but they need to under, uh, lie in under the construct of the program uh, and not be taking uh, the program uh, unnecessarily um, hostage. And one last part uh, on this phase of the discussion. If, if time is money and we want to be efficient in our spending of money, how did we ever allow the desire for cost and schedule predict predictability and the program mandate for independent cost evaluation result in programs becoming 30 to 40% more inefficient in time and money and not achieving the original objective? And, and so we're slowing programs down in excess to improve their predictability to allow them to be closest to the pin on ice, on an ice number that's unnecessarily reflected to make it easier 
uh, for the budgeteers. Uh, and I think that's uh, just an unfortunate set of conditions. So the budget portfolios might allow us to get that all back in check. So Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. That's great, Jeff. And again, lots to chew on there in terms of incentives and, and other issues that we'll, we'll come back to. Uh, Doug Lavero, uh, you're up next. Uh, great, uh, great, Chris, and thank you so much. Thank you, NSSA, for putting this uh, together. I think this is a very important uh, topic, as both uh, as both Ellen and Jeff have uh, said. Let me um, let me approach this from a little bit different perspective, because we can throw out a whole list of, you know, what are the acquisition reforms that we want, and and by the time that all five of us are done, we'll have a list that's. Uh, you know, 20 pages long, and we won't have gotten anything out of it. And let me let me go back. Um, one of the things you asked um, to begin with was, you know, the reports had a lot of ideas, but what were the missed opportunities? So let me let me talk a little bit about the missed opportunities, not because I want to focus on the holes, but because I think we actually have a chance to go ahead and get this get this right. Uh, and I want to start um, from the from the notion that 16 or 26 years ago. When I graduated from um, ICAF, which I can't imagine that was 26 years ago. Oh my God, Alan, you and I graduated at the same time. <laughs> so um, how, where did that time go? Um, I wrote a book um, on acquisition reform uh, back then. My project was a book on acquisition reform that, by the way, was never declassified, so don't bother going looking for it. Um, but, um, you know, I, I studied all the way back to the original acquisition reform um, effort that were called the Carlucci reforms uh, back in the in the 60s um, and and time and time again people wrote these reports about the things we should change and Congress adopted different things and and um, and nothing seems to get any better and so I so when I thought about the questions that you asked I said you know we really should go ahead and deliver a report that has that has fewer answers and more analysis um, in other words the Air Force report says do these nine things the NSSA report says do these 20 things um, but I said but none of it is none of it is done in an academic fashion like we would do if we were in school and start with the following two questions what space acquisition organizations work well and why I mean <laughs> let's let's answer those two questions what space acquisition organizations work well and why well the first thing we have to do is we have to define what do we mean by work working well and so if we want to say what do we mean by, by working well, it's a couple of things. Uh, I, I picked out four. There may be more. Uh, number one, a routinely delivered need and capabilities within acceptable cost and schedule guidelines. Okay, that's not within an ICE. That's not within a two weeks or a year or five years. That's within acceptable cost and schedule guidelines, which is defined by the program itself. Um, the ability to deliver both evolutionary and revolutionary capabilities as the need demands. You got to have. You got to be able to do that is able to leverage the best of commercial and more traditional suppliers rapidly and efficiently um, and is able to successfully transition these space capabilities into an operational environment with a high degree of success. Now, if I take those four characteristics and I ask what organization today reflects those four characteristics, the space acquisition organization that comes closest to that is the NRO. Um, and like Ellen, I've worked in the DOD side, I worked in the NRO side, I worked in NASA side most recently. Um, and when I think about those four things, the routine, routinely delivered needed capabilities, ability to deliver both evolutionary and revolutionary capabilities, leverage the both best of commercial and traditional suppliers and successfully able to transition, the NRO meets those things. So then you have to ask yourself, well, why? Why is the NRO good at this? Because if we can figure that out, well, then that's what we should do with the US Space Force. Um, now, the first one, when I look to answer that question, the first thing um, that both Jeff and Ellen have already said that comes to mind is people. You gotta have, you gotta have people who understand space, who understand the mission, and who are experts in acquisition. And that's a, that takes a long time to develop. This isn't to go to a course at DAU and suddenly Dominus Gaviscum Vecum Spirituo, you're a program manager, it doesn't work that way. Um, it, is a, it is a long, hard slog. Um, I think I finally got good at acquisition maybe after practicing it for 30 years. Uh, I think that's about how long it took me. Um, and the traditional DOD system does not allow that to happen, especially on the uniform side uh, of the uh, of the envelope um, uh, for us. It moves people around before they can get those deep skills. 
And so one of the things that I saw missed in the uh, missed opportunity for both the Air Force report and SSA is to talk about that people skill and to do that, do we have the right mixture of uniformed individuals and civilian individuals? Um, it's interesting to note that the US Space Force does not even have a civilian component to it. It only has a military component to it. Uh, I think that's a mistake because if you're gonna build good space acquisition people over time, you're gonna need a mixture of, of long-term civilian leadership, not just people populating program offices, but leadership uh, mixed with um, knowledgeable um, military members who understand the mission. So number one is people, and we can talk a lot about uh, people. Number two, is a direct alignment between program authority, accountability, those two are often put together, but, but the next two are not, the dollars and the mission, okay? It's not just authority and accountability, but it's also you gotta be the dollars and the mission. All four of those things have to be aligned. And I think it's interesting um, to note, if I asked anybody on this call today, who would you need to go to at the NRO if you want, if you want a decision made on the imminent architecture, everybody would know they could go ahead and, and say, we need to go talk to Troy Mink and he could make the decisions. And if I asked you the same question today, who would you need to go to to make a decision on the GPS architecture for the Air Force? I don't think any of us could figure out who the heck we would go to or what 20 people we'd have to go to in order to make that decision, which clearly means we don't have a, a alignment between authority, accountability, the dollars and the missions. Uh, I think that's a huge mistake right now. Number three, um, we need a financial system that allows the right balance between oversight and fiscal controls. Um, that, that financial system, you know, it's interesting, um, the Air Force report uh, talks about uh, the um, efficient uh, space procurement, ESP stuff, which is sort of gets at the right thing, but I think it, it misses the point a little bit. Um, it's more towards, um, uh, towards Jeff's portfolio um, uh, position where you know you put the you you put big baskets of money against specific portfolio of missions and then you align that accountability that I talked to previously and you let people manage um, that accountability and they'll still report on individual programs but they have the ability to move the money back and forth and basically that's fairly simply done uh, with the National Reconnaissance Office because almost all of their dollars are um, R and D dollars which means they they spend incrementally. So we don't need to do create any new fiscal controls. We can just use the ones we have today, which is really to go ahead and allow incremental spending of dollars, which by the way, interestingly enough, at NASA, um, when I had the programs over there, that's how all my dollars looked over there uh, for space programs. The, the, fourth, uh, the fourth thing that I talk about is a very narrow <clears throat> acquisition decision chain um, that's still responsive to warfighter needs. You know, you have to, we, we talk about the JSIDS process <clears throat> or um, some, of the, um, some of the other requirements processes that exist, but the bottom, the bottom line is you still need to be responsive to warfighter needs. And I think Alan's right, you know, the, the requirements have to be controlled. They can't be so specific, but at the same time, we need to make, we need to understand this integrates into a big, uh, a big enterprise. What we have to do is we have to match that need process, that requirements process with the acquisition decision chain um, to make sure that those two are aligned uh, correctly. And sometimes that's hard to do when you set up space acquisition councils and you have a separate JSONs process over here. And then we have an SAE who lives someplace else. We don't get a very good uh, alignment and it's not a narrow process. And it needs to be a, a very narrow process. And you'll see at the NRO, it's a fairly, fairly narrow chain um, that, uh, that defines that. And the final thing is in order to really allow um, revolutionary things to happen and in order to allow things to happen very quickly is you need an alignment of science and research oversight within the acquisition structure of the organization. Um, the NRO does this with the AS&T enterprise. I'm, I'm glad to see the Space Force um, won the battle to bring the space portions of AFRL into the Space Force. Um, let's align that correctly under the Space Systems Command and let's make sure that we understand how do we make sure that we tie what's done at AFRL to what happens in programs in the future. That's been a very loose collaboration over time um, and that needs to be a much tighter collaboration. We were always able to build that collaboration in the past at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base between the Flight Dynamics Lab and the Avionics Lab. Kind of broke down after we, um, in, in later years, but it was very tight to begin with. We need to allow that tightness to, uh, to really happen again. 
in this in the way that it does at the NRO today. So so those are the those are the five things that I that I pick out based upon looking at which are successful organizations. And I think if I think if we really want Congress to listen, we need to we need to lay that out as a very academic list in order for them to understand how do how did we arrive at these suggestions we want you to undertake. And I'll leave it there. That's great. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, Don Hard, you're up next. Works better when I unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, and my thanks also to, uh, to uh, NSSA for hosting this event. I feel a little, uh, uh, a little out of place here. I, I, I don't call myself an acquisition expert. I've never been an acquisition program manager. And, and uh, so, for, so I am uh, happy uh, to uh, say me too, to many of the things that all already have been said by, by the, the other panelists who have had much broader experience than I in that field. Um, and I had planned to defer to them anyhow, but it was, it was uh, simply a, a, a matter of sequence, I guess, which makes it uh, all that much easier. But I, I would like to say a few comments uh, that, that I had put together, uh, mostly my forte, uh, if, if any, in the acquisition business was, was uh, leading the, uh, uh, the uh, SAF AQ office in, in which our real job was putting together the budget. So I got to see the broad scope of, of not, not just the acquisition program management, which I had no acquisition authority in, but the, uh, but the uh, balance between uh, the acquisition program, its progress, its problems, and the requirements processes uh, that, that uh, had to go along uh, in, in uh, right, right arm in arm with it. And of course, uh, the budget uh, process, that was, that was our job. Uh, the PPB uh, was, was what AQS was all about. Um, so I'd like to kind of address that broader, take that broader perspective and, and, and address uh, a little bit of, of acquisition reform uh, and, and, a, and a couple of pieces that have already been mentioned, I might, might add, and I, and I totally agree with what's been said so far. And I'll just mention again, perhaps for emphasis, uh, uh, I, I intend to focus on, on the one element of, of proposed reforms, uh, which is the, uh, the operational requirements process. Uh, I think there's agreement as we've already heard that uh, that is an important and, and I would say a, a vital uh, element uh, in the envisioned reform. I think the priorities in the Air Force uh, or Space Force uh, proposal seem about right. And I, I would note that the first one of the five goals that they address, uh, and which are great goals in my opinion, but the first one addressed uh, is uh, uh, streamlining requirements validation. Uh, so that speaks to the importance in, in the view of, of uh, the Space Force, Air Force paper. It is addressed, of course, in more detail as they get into the, the fifth feature in, in which uh, they, uh, they talk about uh, uh, how we could go about uh, changing some things to make that uh, a little more real. Uh, but I would, I would just caution that, that uh, making uh, uh, the requirements process, as agile as the as the rest of the processes, is going to be hard. Uh, I say that with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, scars on my back from from uh, uh, watching and, and participating in, in long term uh, alternatives of uh, or analyses of alternatives. Uh, it just strikes me that that yes, we we do need to change JSIDs. I think there's some very good proposals within within the uh, within the Air Force uh, paper, the Space Force paper. Paper uh, specifically, I think the use of uh, high level joint uh, performance requirements rather than detailed system parameters makes a whole lot more sense for an agile approach, and certainly more sense than, than the ironclad uh, JROC approved uh, KPPs that could uh, stop the program in its tracks. If you uh, if you violated them by one tenth of a percent, uh, I believe they are there, and and I and I, I like what I've heard already because I, I I was going to defer to the other panel members to to hopefully speak a little bit about how the NRO handles uh, their approach to acquisition. I think there's much to be learned there. In terms of prioritizations of of all the of all the things that are that are suggested within the Air Force proposal, now let me offer just a few comments on that. 
uh, and I offer them sort of in a flow to come to a, to come to a rationale for priority number one. Uh, first, I, I believe we we all are recognizing and must recognize uh, that the, uh, the the speed of need for space acquisition, is, as J T Thompson uh, calls it, the speed of need is certainly changing, and, and we simply must change our processes to meet that speed of need if we are to uh, effectively uh, develop and, and field space capability for the joint fight. Uh, as properly noted in, in Secretary Barrett's uh, proposal, the, the whole acquisition requirements, contracting, budgeting, programming approach, and all the relevant processes will need to be changed somewhat to match uh, the evolving speed of need. I might add that's especially true for leveraging new commercial space capabilities as they evolve. But as I've already said, uh, agile uh, acquisition pra uh, practices, and we have already said, uh, require equally agile operations requirements and equally agile uh, funding uh, processes. Uh, operational requirements would, would uh, hopefully be addressed uh, routinely uh, in, uh, in continuing negotiations, changes, validation uh, during program development feeling. But the, 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 the related authorities, in, in, in my view, uh, uh, are, that are most important, and I, and I agree with all that's been said uh, regarding uh, the need for the, the right kind of team, uh, the, the right kinds of authorities throughout the, the whole, the whole uh, uh, enterprise. But in the final analysis, and, and Ellen's already said this, that any desired changes that you want to do in, a, in an agile uh, environment will require equally agile funding flexibility as well. So all the things that have been mentioned, the, the, uh, the budget line item consolidation and restructure, the, uh, the uh, hopefully uh, incremental funding approach, without approved funding, there's going to be very limited opportunities, in my view, uh, for significant changes in, in acquisition of Jolie. Uh, this has to be the cornerstone, will be the cornerstone for any future uh, reformed acquisition system. And obviously, uh, the uh, the Air Force thinks that is so because they identify that as their number one priority, the Air Force and Space Force. I'm sure they are engaged with Congress to try to figure out how to make that more sensible, and I and I hope I wish they have uh, uh, great success in doing that. That's all I've got for right now. Great, thank you, Don. Uh, Tom Conroy, over to you. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks to NSSA for, dare I say, leading the charge on the importance of space, helping to make it real for the broader community. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to share my experience in the NRO that was the exemplar for me of what we would like to have for the future. Whether we can get back to that kind of a streamlined management system is an open question. However, with that said, in response to the questions you've asked of us, uh, Chris, um, I was impressed with the uh, U.S. Space Force uh, Alternative Acquisition System paper. Um, I think while it's, I would characterize it as not perfect and not complete, it offers very critical enabling steps and, and recommendations. If they can be adopted, then much of the rest of what uh, the panel, our panel members have said and that I would add to uh, is achievable. Uh, in particular, their, what they characterize as their top three recommendations uh, deal with uh, uh, budgeting flexibility and uh, the ability to make decisions on a shortened decision loop. Um, delegating down to the to the lowest possible level, uh, eliminating uh, a lot of reviews that add little value beyond checking boxes. Uh, I think all those can be achieved within the recommendations they've put forward and I'm very hopeful that, uh, that they are successful with Congress and with their internal realignment. So there's some very significant goodness in, in what they've recommended. Um, the NSSA paper, is very attractive in my view in that it uh, takes, uh, takes off from the uh, US Space Force acquisition system uh, recommendations and points out some additional factors that will be in, uh, critical to success. Um, the number one 
uh, item was also recommended early on uh, by, I think, Ellen and uh, um, Doug, uh, which is personnel. Uh, when I was in the NRO in my initial time was in the 80s and 90s, early 80s and uh, 90s, um, and the, the workforce there, the programs A, B, and C, were people who had served for a long time. They, they came there, they learned the skill, their trade, uh, they advanced within the organization, and they uh, demonstrated terrific uh, skill and capability in acquisition, managing acquisitions, and, and uh, balancing that, keeping their eye out for uh, technology advances that made possible new things that didn't percolate out of a requirements process. Basically, the NRO of those days had a, a great deal of flexibility and focus on um, what does technology make possible? What are needs that are not yet being met, but could be met if we made some adaptations or added some capabilities to existing programs, et cetera? Uh, this is quite different from where we are today. Uh, we're, today we want to wait for needs and requirements to be uh, vocalized and then budgeted for and then ultimately taken into practice. The NRO shortened that cycle uh, quite dramatically. And to the extent that we can build in the budgetary flexibility, the decision-making uh, delegations and, and accountability and authority, uh, I think we can, we can be much more successful than we are now. And I think this is, this is critical to what uh, Don cited, uh, I guess, J.T. Thompson on this speed of need. Um, I think there's much we could do. Um, the other uh, point that was uh, made in the NSSA paper that I, that I could really resonate with is the uh, absolute uh, focus on uh, mission success. Uh, what I have observed uh, over the last uh, I left government in uh, 2001, so I've been out almost 20 years. But what I've observed is that the, uh, the metric for success these days has a great deal to do with properly checking boxes and not overrunning budgets and adhering to milestones, as has been said earlier. Uh, whereas in many days in the past, the focus was on, are we adding value to the mission? Now, Times have changed. Uh, when I was in the NRO, we were still in the Cold War, or most of the time I was in the NRO, we were in the Cold War. And survival as a nation was uh, at risk. Uh, we never knew whether an uh, ICBM attack would be launched by the former Soviet Union. It would end it all. Uh, and we need, felt we needed to be successful in order to survive. These days, uh, that imperative is no longer present. So. Uh, I believe that there is a growing imperative uh, on the importance of space that makes that, that brings that back to some extent, whether it's widely perceived that the, we need to uh, shorten decision chains and take a little bit of risk and delegate a little bit more authority in order to survive, to secure our, our long-term survival and success in space uh, remains to be seen, but, but clearly the, these two papers and the attention of the Congress in creating the Space Force is demonstrating that the nation is much more aware now than they were in the past of the importance of space. Uh, a, uh, one final thing I would uh, point out was a, a recent interview with uh, uh, retired General David Goldfein uh, in which he spoke of space. And uh, I found it stunning that uh, uh, he characterized in his interview that uh, in over 2,000 war games, um, what we had found was that uh, our success militarily was uh, significantly uh, reduced if we were not, if we did not emerge victorious in space. Uh, that any military action or confrontation, if we didn't retain our ability to operate securely in space, was uh, not likely to be successful. So all of that says that these two papers combined are a transformational moment for the nation. Uh, my hope uh, and my belief is that the Air Force is trying their best. Congress has made a strong statement that they wish to make some changes and to enhance our, our prospects for the future. And I much 
much needs to be demonstrated in the days, weeks, and months ahead to see whether that commitment uh, will bear fruit. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Those are, those are all uh, very useful and practical suggestions. Um, let, me, let me try to build on that. We've, we've got a number of uh, questions that have come in and also uh, some key topical areas. I just want to uh, quickly ask you, uh, each of you, uh, what do you see as the most important actions that the leadership in the Space Force, uh, the new Space Systems Command, and other parts of the Space Force should be taking now to better position the national security space enterprise to meet these pressing challenges? We have counter space threats that are multiplying. We have internal problems, et cetera. What, what do you see as, as at the top of the list? What, what would be at the top of your list for the recommendations you would make to the folks who are running Space uh, Force now and especially the Space Systems Command? And uh, Ellen, would you like to go first with that? Sure, thanks, Chris. Uh, it's a really good question. Um, and it's one I was thinking about as I listened to the you know, the wide variety of uh, inputs I got from my, uh, from my fellow uh, panel members here. And I think in my mind, it, it gets back to the fundamental issue of um, developing the architectures for moving forward, because that's foundational. On, you know, we can talk as we have for roughly the last 50 minutes about how best to go about buying things. But we're all wrong if we buy the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so in my mind, and, this, and there are a number of the recommendations that are in here that address this. The JSIDS process, uh, the relationship between um, industry and government, uh, and in particular, the requirements thing we've talked about. The reason why I think that's probably the fundamental thing and it's tied to the architecture is in my experience, particularly when I was at the NRO, but also elsewhere, when you started to look at how you were going to go about um, providing to the nation the capability they wanted, I often found that we neglected to consider a more holistic approach of getting the answer. So, you know, just a broad example, um, we need to find something very accurately. And so we rely on the space system to do that. And when we do that, we drive ourselves to architectures that use very exquisite technology. Um, in the case of, uh, you know, some of the space systems out at SMC, they take five to seven years to build and test. Well, you cannot, I don't care how good your streamlined acquisition processes are, how good your improvements in contracting is, but if it takes five to seven years to just build the satellite, you are not going to have the speed. But that, so that means we have to buy different things. And by, and if we do that, we may not be able to get the four digits of accuracy purely from a space system. It's going to require that we leverage other uh, sources of um, capabilities to include things like social media for identity, you know. So I think when, in my mind, the biggest issue is to get after this requirements piece and understand how much we can expect from our space systems at partic and how can we best leverage everything that's out there in these and oh, by the way, not take 18 months to two years to do an AOA so I can get to uh, block, uh, you know, I can get to that milestone that Jeff talked about and Don, and Don talked about. You know, getting our hands around these requirements, getting that relationship between the industry and the government together so that we can get to getting things fielded at the, at the uh, need you know, at the speed of need, as uh, DT would say, and I think in my mind, the key to that is the architecture that embraces not trying to put all of the requirements that drive us then to these big exquisite satellites, but, but look at how do we leverage so many of the other things that are going on. And that's really the main focus of that. 
is the requirements process. So that's where I would tackle it, the architecture associated with having to pull together the requirements. Outstanding, thank you. Uh, Jeff Harris. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm gonna pile on uh, where Ellen left off uh, with, with one side note. I had written a paper years ago, it was sitting on the counter and my mother, the school teacher, uh, was providing corrections to the paper and we sat down for dinner that night. She said, you people sure use the word architecture funny. Um, and, and, and so it always sort of stuck with me. And um, what we're talking here about uh, in, in all of the panelists' conversation is um, a, 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 a responsive system engineering process. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to work uh, with and around uh, some extraordinary system engineers. And um, if you think back, what makes them extraordinary is they have an ability to focus on what's important in the moment. And we risk manage um, in order to prioritize where the effort should go. And, and so the bureaucracy um, that we embrace has trouble making these risk managed trades. And the system engineers can sort of prioritize how we minimize our, our maximum regret. And, and so um, for, for years I've sort of, uh, uh, Don Hart earlier this, this morning uh, mentioned analysis of alternatives. Uh, uh, Ellen Palachowski just, just mentioned them as, as well. Uh, for years I've said, the Air Force uses analysis of alternatives as, as um, secondary schooling for majors because no analysis of alternative has ever resulted in an alternative, uh, but it does generate uh, a lot of good thinking. Uh, it's just not part of sort of the program buying cycle. And um, uh, to Ellen's point, we have to get what we buy is right. When we make a decision, you have to move on with that decision. You got to do it with speed and determination. And, and so now, Chris, in answer to your question, um, we, we stand in awe at the speed that technology infuses all of our lives. And uh, I remember sitting two years before a launch of a, a brand new block of a satellite where we were still fighting over the invention of the material for the, the flight computer substrate, and we launched on time. Uh, today's system you know, would not allow a 6.2 or a 6.3 technology to get anywhere near a flight back to the, uh, the point that I just made. But we needed the computer in order to meet the mission and we came up with a whole new architecture and we mitigated it. And, and, and so we moved through with a check and balance within the program uh, that took place. So we sit here now uh, and we'll talk about commercial, I think more in this conversation uh, over the next hour, but we have commercial technology and the investment that the world's making in technology. Uh, we have commercial practices and the way that we integrate services into our sort of mechanical architectures. And so I'm a big, I'm a big fan of how we embrace services. And, and, and so if I can risk manage and pick and choose the technologies and the services to plug and play, uh, you know, Don mentioned the, com, uh, the communications architecture, uh, Ellen was on, let's get the, the, the pieces of the pie sort of in the right order. We have an ability to plug and play uh, very flexibly. Um, I was in a briefing a couple months ago uh, with one of the Air Force leaders and he was describing the impact of a particular commercial company had on the Air Force thinking around space. And um, I started taking notes because our colleagues in the Air Force had sort of said, you know, this company may never get it right. And a couple of years later, as they got it right, they had, com uh, they had committed action into success. And, and so a similar list of eight things. Um, the cadre effectiveness and efficiency, the flight software development and environment with development and operational synchronization, software validation at 100% with three sets of eyes, 
hardware success with commercial hardware gaining important uh, gaining and granting important redundancy because commercial hardware is lower cost uh, and it can be flown in space hard enclosures. Um, normal development tools are being used versus exotic space methods, um, running faster than the intellectual property, and understanding that code freeze, code freeze dates don't give you anywhere near the protection that they once did and actually is a lien. And the commercial people have better thinking about how to manage uh, the evolution of code that ought to be in, uh, embraced. And the final thing that the Air Force uh, gentleman said was, I wonder why DOD continues to think that it's special when all of these pieces are available in the marketplace. So Chris, back to your answer. I think we have a framework uh, for acquisition that we can operate in. I think we can empower the program managers. I think there are tools that were not available uh, when some of us on the panel here were practicing the craft uh, in the arena. Uh, and it's a huge opportunity space for uh, the country and the operators to benefit uh, from a responsive acquisition system. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Doug Lavero. Sure, thanks, Chris. I'll be, I'll be quick so we can save time for uh, questions at the end. Uh, next step, let me talk about one next step. And, and by the way, the focus on system engineering and architectures that both uh, Ellen and uh, Jeff talked about are, are critically important things. But let me, let me, if I put myself where we are today, uh, sitting here in July of 2020, um, and I say, what is the next step that we have to do? Um, I think the most critical thing is to get the acquisition organization right within um, the U.S. Space Force. And I, and I fear right now um, that that is not happening because there's a power struggle going on, as there normally would be in the Pentagon, as happens all the time, um, between different centers that, who want to be in control of things. Um, without stepping back um, and uh, non parochially saying, you know, what, how do we set this up to work? And so we already, in, in fact, the Space Force has already sort of set up a, a um, even in their paper, um, has set up um, a struggle between the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space um, Acquisition and Integration, um, the, um, the Service Acquisition Executive uh, at SAFAQ, um, the head of the Space Systems Command um, that will be established pretty soon, the Assistant Secretary of, um, Pol of Defense for Space Policy. Um, these are all, these all end up becoming different centers, new centers, that already exist within an, a, a, a structure that includes uh, ANS um, and DDR&E uh, and the struggle for who's gonna be in charge. And out of that struggle, if you don't go ahead and, and decide quickly, how do we run this process? Who's gonna be responsible for programs, for budgeting for those programs, for making sure the right people are in those programs? If I go back and you know we're all we're all dinosaurs here. Some of us are more dinosaur than others uh, on this call, but uh, we're all dinosaurs here. We, you know, so um, I that remark. I know. Uh, you know, it, back when uh, when I, I know that when I was growing up in this system, and and most of the others were growing up in the system, a lot of that was found within Air Force Systems Command, um, and where we had acquisition authority lined up with personnel authority. This was critically important. Personnel authority was done within the command. Um, that's again, that's done today within the NRO, um, that personnel authority. Um, so trying to think about how do you align this organization where you can actually align all the right authority so you can make decisions, I would, I would say the next step is to focus on that problem. Get that alignment right. Make sure, because out of that alignment, you'll have the individual who can then talk to Congress about why some of these reforms that the Air Force is proposing or that NSSA is proposing are the right reforms, who can take responsibility if the reforms don't work, who can go ahead and make adjustments as time goes on. If you decentralize the power for that, um, you will never be able to go ahead and figure out who was accountable for the errors and who was accountable for the successes. So I think focusing on getting the organization structure right to do acquisition within the Space Force is the, key, is the key next step that we have to do. I, of course, have my own opinions of how that should look, um, but I would say that this is, uh, rather than giving solutions, this is the next step that we have to focus on. That's helpful. Don Hard. 
Yeah, I, I would just uh, say again, thanks for uh, all the good words ahead of me. I don't have very much else to add, but I would key on what you just said, Doug. Uh, I, I think not only getting, getting the organizational structure and approach right is important, but let's try it on. Uh, I know there have been some reviews already done as to how we would intend to operate uh, you know, if we are to achieve the agile organization and agile authorities that we need. Why not try them out now? Why, why not get into the mode of routine reviews? Why not get into the mode of routine responses on changes to the program? Why not get into the mode of routine responses on changes to requirements? What do we do if, if we get into that battle rhythm now of saying we've got to do this more quickly, I think I think that would that would be very helpful. Having said that, I, I would caution because that implies that we've done our homework, and I hate to be one to suggest yet another review, but there has to have been some sort of review done to identify, first of all, the problems and issues we're trying to solve, and secondly, how we would go about to get a baseline of understanding today between the acquired, the program acquisition office, the the, uh, the operators that, that are expecting and needing the capability and the industry that's providing them that capability. So, so I, I think there, there probably has to be some level of review. I like what was said about the standards in architecture. And, and oh, and by the way, I, did, did you talk with Mike Hamill this morning? Because I did, and he used the exact same words you used. <laughs> so so uh, uh, Mike, uh, would, if he was participating, and he, he, unfortunately he can't, he has other commitments, but if he was here now, I think he'd, 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 he'd offer, offer a Me Too comment regarding the, the, the need for an understanding of the, of the overall architecture that's within which we're, we're getting this new capability and changing this capability as we go. And I like what you said also about uh, uh, systems engineering, Jeff, because to me, uh, I'll go one further than you in your description of, a, of, a, of an AOA. Uh, an AOA, in my view, should just be an extension of sys good systems engineering with others involved, the operators and industry, right, and, and the budgeteers. But instead, we've made the AOA, I, I, would, I would call it the arena for the all-out fight between acquirers, operators, budgeteers, <laughs> and sometimes industry if they're allowed in the door. <laughs> Uh, but it is a great learning process if you have the luxury of time, but my God, a year for an AOA, come on. Yeah, let's, let's get serious. So that's, that, would be, uh, that would be all I've got for that response, Chris. Thank you again. Thank you. Tom. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'd make uh, two observations. One is I think, um, I think aligning authorities quickly, getting somebody who has all the pieces together um, and can make decisions quickly and can represent the rationale for those decisions is critically important. And the second part of, of my response is that doing so soon empowers that individual to represent the, uh, the needs of this new space force uh, coherently and effectively and persuasively, hopefully with the Congress. Uh, Congress is key. Congress has uh, for many years uh, been viewed as an adversary because oftentimes their inputs were to, to tell the program manager how to run his program or altering budgets or putting milestones on to, to get back to them before they'd allow a program to go ahead. And getting somebody in charge with the, with the full span of control who interacts sufficiently regularly with the Congress and ideally with the members, not just with the staffs, is gonna be critical to the success of this venture. Um, basically, what we need to reestablish is uh, a relationship of trust and uh, proven uh, success in delivering capabilities. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot of potential near term. A lot of people have recognized that, and so that's all a good thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a related aspect of my suggestion that that uh, authority be consolidated as quickly as possible, and that relates to classification. Uh, some of the most important things that are gonna come out of this Space Force are going to, by their very nature, need to be classified. We can't have the adversaries, our adversaries knowing 
the defensive or offensive capabilities that we're planning to put into space and and having the clarity of who's in charge of advocating for that and that and that individual or very small group of individuals able to say what they've looked at and why the threat justifies uh, whatever is required, new money or shifting of money, that will be critical to the success of this uh, larger venture. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, really appreciate it. Uh, wow, some great, uh, great issues to follow up on. Uh, on the security front that you raise, Tom, a key point, I would just make a, a short plug for the Studies and Analysis Center. We have a, a major review of security underway um, and uh, we'll be meeting with some folks inside the department soon to be discussing uh, their recent steps to address issues on the security of uh, space systems as well. It's a, it's a very important topic. Let me shift uh, to an issue related to uh, commercial capabilities. And Jeff, you, you touched on this a little bit. Um, any of you that wish to, uh, to respond to this, you're welcome to do so. Um, and this is a very high level question. You can dive in in whichever angles you'd, you'd like on this. What role can and should commercial systems and capabilities play in the US national uh, security space architecture? And rec what recommendations do you have for the Space Force on how and when to incorporate commercial capabilities? And is this better done through contracting for services or actually acquiring satellites or, or launchers? So uh, a wide open door here for discussion of, of the role of commercial. Um, who would like to go first on that one? Well, I know you're not all retiring types, so somebody uh, raise your hand. I, 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 can give you, I, I can give you a little, a little go ahead, Don. I can give you a little background that might, that might prompt some, some further discussion. And I, and I think uh, wh whether our report was uh, accepted or not, some of the recommendations we made in a previous effort that I, that I undertook under, under the sponsorship of, of the uh, ISAG, the Independent uh, Senior, Advise Senior Assessment Group that was headed uh, by uh, General Welch at the time, in, in which we looked at uh, uh, the, the, uh, the whole notion of commercial space. This is four or five years ago. And of course, it's ballooned since then. But even at the time, uh, there were uh, a lot of, of big projects planned to include, uh, you know, huge constellations, and a lot of and a lot of uh, capability being offered quickly and at reasonable cost. We urged the Air Force within that within that report to to get involved, uh, to to buy a little, try a little. Uh, uh, not let this opportunity be wasted, but instead to leverage it. I think the Air Force has, has started to do that and has made some progress in doing that. But, but to me, the whole, the whole idea would be, and, and, I, and I think this issue of acquisition reform hinges on it, the whole idea would be uh, to posture ourselves in such a way that, that we can easily and effectively leverage what's emerging from commercial space uh, initiatives. Yeah, Chris. Um, yes, please. You know, a couple of, of thoughts on this. Um, you know, I, I got into the space business late in my career. My first space job was actually working for my camel out in L.A. as a brand new one star. And so I, I didn't come in with um, this view that you had to have umpteen years of space experience to do space acquisition, nor was I completely understanding of the big line between commercial and um, and national security. And, and, and I found um, extreme cultural biases against using commercial. My first experience was with uh, satellite communication and, and where, you know, we tried to look at ways to leverage the commercial SATCOM uh, by doing things like hosted payloads and uh, and leveraging uh, the tremendous capabilities they had. And there was a lot of not invented here and hand-wringing and concerns. And then, you know, when I came back as the um, SMC commander, one of the first things I did was to sign a cooperative research and development agreement with Elon Musk to bring SpaceX in and get them certified. And again, it there was just tremendous um, 
resistance. Uh, Doug, I don't know if you remember, we just, you know, um, in terms of, no, they, because they were doing things differently. And now, and, and then frankly, I also had an experience when I was at the NRO when we were looking at, this was back in 2008 when we were looking at commercial imagery versus, um, you know, a, a major investment in uh, future capability. And this got, get, is where I get back to this comment about the architectures. You know, if you define an architecture that drives you to have a requirement that will not allow you to leverage commercial, um, that's a mistake. And so in my mind, uh, that's why it gets back to, uh, sorry, Jeff, but whether it's architecture or plan, you know, the first steps of system engineering, but when you first start looking at this whole basic question of tell me what you need, tell me what you got, um, we, we would be extremely remiss to not leverage what's going on in the commercial world. It is absolutely essential that we do this and it enables us to open up our eyes. And that's why we have to be a little careful when we put out these comments, these recommendations about the systems engineering process. Because I'll tell you what that often translates to is this very rigorous structured approach that doesn't provide you the opportunity to, to put new ideas in. So I think that it is essential as we go to the future that we embrace the commercial product and understand how it can be leveraged but we also have to do that with our eyes open for two things commercial space is still pretty new and the business case is is going to be um needs to be closed um, is there going to be a true commercial market um for some of these proliferated leo constellations it's looking promising um so we have to keep that in mind that if we put too much of our eggs in the commercial basket, we could end up having uh, it backfire for us if uh, that market doesn't materialize. Uh, so that's, that's, that's part of what we have to be careful about. And then we also need to ask ourselves the question, which I know the Space Development Agency has um, come up with one answer um, which is they want their own protected com um, in proliferated Leo. They don't want to leverage the commercial um, com, and, and they're doing that because they're concerned about what happens when the bullets start flying in space. And that's part of what we have to have our eyes open in, and that's the uh, security aspect of it. Um, if we embrace as part of our essential mission capability that we're gonna leverage commercial space systems, then our approach has to include how these systems will be protected as, as we go into um, a hostile environment. And that means that um, our whole space architecture has to also address how do we protect space in the broader sense, not just for those unique military things, but for commercial in order to enable it to be there when we need it. I mean, that I think is a, um, a question that I, I see thrown out a lot when we talk about commercial is, well, you know, when the bullets start firing and this stuff goes away, then we're, uh, you know, where are we? Well, we need to address how do we make sure that when the bullets start firing, we don't lose that commercial capability because it's going to be critical, not just to us from a national security, but from an economic perspective. So I, I it, it can't just be, oh yeah, let's go buy some off the shelf uh, imagery because the uh, commercial guys are there. It has to be looked at in the broader sense. And if we don't do that, then we will fail at um, being able to truly leverage space as a capability for the country. Yeah, back to the notion of a of an integrated architecture, uh, as you're referencing there. Any other uh, takers on that question, Jeff? Yeah, I. Well, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, Chris, I got a, uh, several things. Um, Jeff, so, you're up next. Oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, um, 
I think that I mean this is this is uh, critical uh, for us as we as we think about how we move uh, forward here. You know, when when I was in uh, policy and we started talking about resiliency and and all the other kind of things that lead to resiliency, which is obviously key uh, to the future. Um, it actually begins. We uh, it began before that, as we were talking about what are the natural advantages that the U.S. holds over our adversaries. Um, it used to be in the Cold War the national advantages advantages we held at our, our adversaries where we had better financial resources and we had better technology if it was vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. Um, and so we could leverage that and that really led to the precision weaponry um, that uh, um, held us in great stead during the, during the Cold War and beyond. Uh, but when we look at the Chinese, that's not one of our national natural advantages. They're good in technology. They have a lot of financial capability. What are the other advantages we have? One of the key advantages the U.S. has um, is its entrepreneurial nature. The fact um, that it has this entrepreneurial sector, which creates commercial capability, um, is an incredible tool that we have to figure out how to leverage. Now, that comes with all the issues that um, Ellen um, talked about in terms of reliability and how do you focus it in architecture and things like that. And I once uh, talked about this uh, with, um, with folks in the Space Force, and I said, you know, we, we sometimes forget the lessons that we learned back in the Army. There are really three kinds of systems that we have within the DOD, and this applies to space. There are combat systems, there are combat support systems, and there are combat services. Um, and and the army, it's very clear that you that these three demarcations exist. There's a tank is a combat system, a uh, a communication system is a combat support system, um, and the logistics hauling of um, stuff to the battle to the battlefront is a combat service. And it allows us to figure out which things do we need to own, which things do we need to control, and which things can we go ahead um, and and yield to others. Um, in the example that Ellen gave about launch, and she's exactly right, boy, when I got to, when I got to SMC in 2008, they wouldn't even go three miles down the street and talk to the SpaceX folks. Um, so, so we, we, we changed that. Um, but, um, but, you know, launch, um, even though it's really noisy and it's got the big flames coming out of it, it's basically a logistics operation. It's a combat service. Um, so it's perfectly appropriate that we would turn to the commercial world for launch um, because that is a combat service. Um, an anti-satellite system, probably not a good idea to go with the commercial service on that. That's probably a combat system. And you can, you can look at the different space capabilities and say, where do I need to own and control? Where can I take some risk? And that's probably in the combat support side. Um, and where can I go ahead and take greater risk because it's a combat service for which there's a large number of places for me to go ahead and get the service. And Doug, let me interrupt you just briefly. Um, in some cases, the commercial capabilities are signif significantly ahead of U.S. government capabilities, as we've discussed before, and for example, in, in uh, commercial space domain awareness. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, which, by the way, is a combat support um, capability, which means it's a, got a, it's a good place to integrate commercial and, uh, and uh, boutique uh, capabilities. So the first thing is we have to do it, and there's a and and that's a good uh, thinking mechanism to think about how do we make decisions on it rather than randomly deciding let's go here let's go there. The second thing is we have to get better at it. Okay, and this is this is key, and we have to and this goes back to the AOA uh, discussion that uh, both Jeff and and Don Don had. And by the way, I'll give you my other my description of the AOA. An AOA is, a, is, a, is an excuse not to go ahead and make a decision. That's why we use AOAs. Is it just in case we can't make a decision, let's do another AOA. Um, so um, so this, is, this is the key of how do you know when to invest <clears throat> in a commercial capability? When should you feel comfortable about it? And the answer is normally earlier than you will think. Uh, I was asked at a conference one time, um, you know, how I would, how, how I would choose which commercial capability. In this case, there were, you know, at the time, multiple uh, LEO satellite constellations uh, that were being talked about. Which one would I choose? How would I choose which one to invest in? And my answer is, why would I choose? Why wouldn't I give $50 million to every one of them? And somebody said, well, wasn't that a waste of money? And I said, well, you know, 
I think I spent, um, spent about $3 billion on a imagery system for the NRO that was ultimately canceled. That's probably a bigger waste of money um, than um, putting $50 million against 10 different folks and having one or two of them succeed. Because if I'm gonna get the security that Ellen talked about in terms of network security and cyber hardness, I need to have my money at the table at the beginning of the process to make sure my requirements are practiced. And that's cheap money. That is the cheapest money you'll find in your space development effort. Uh, and by the way, we did that with Iridium back in the 90s. Um, in fact, in 1994, we made the decision to make that investment. I, I was lucky enough to be party to that decision uh, back then before Iridium launched its first satellite. And when they went bankrupt, we ended up owning the Constellation. Uh, so, so it actually worked out pretty well for us financially. But the point is, if you want to engage with commercial, you have to adopt that entrepreneurial spirit that some of those things are going to fail. But that's okay, because at the end of the day, you'll get better capability sooner by going ahead and making those investments. And I'll stop there. Jeff, over to you. So I think a great discussion. Um, we use commercial both as a noun as an adjective. Um, we buy everything commercially at arm's length transactions. And somehow as government employees, we think we're threatened by commercial um, because they have freedoms that we as government employees can't enjoy or those of us in the commercial aren't overly constrained. But it's this, it's this amalgamation of how do I do research and development? How do I buy parts? How do I do the logistics? So I think Doug gave us a very good, a very good framework. Um, a lot of the technologies that we want to embrace want to be put in the commercial terms. And going back to the FAR and the DFAR, we, we got to make sure that you can buy it like you buy everything else that's in life. And, and so when we were doing the trans, transformational comms architecture and the analysis of all the alternatives, it was clear while at war, 80 to 90% of our, of our lift of stuff and our lift of bits was commercial. And everybody was happy and we had done the trades, which this, this percentage goes on protected comms. And, and this is how um, we fail hard or fail through different paths of resiliency. And so I think we have lots of examples of how to do this. And so we've talked about commercial launch, uh, we've now talked about, we, we're about to talk about how Amazon and Microsoft um, are, are going to offer us ground station services. They're going to do that for your services. And, and, and so the, the provisioning of these technologies, it says, I can provision a FedEx service to move the stuff, or I can uh, provision a web service to go do that. And as, as Doug alluded to, uh, we have put a huge priority as a country on the safe passage of space and understanding the battle space for both commerce uh, and military operations. Yet we have elected as a country not to do a good job on space situational awareness. And so there are a bevy of commercial capabilities that could be aligned much better to provide a framework for us and our allies to understand space operations. And back to Doug's point, can be done at a fraction of the cost of what we're doing. But we have elected, to Don's point, to admire this problem now uh, for a couple decades. And we're all guilty of not having a space order of battle and having a space order of battle that can be responsible to Jay Raymond what he needs. Uh, and, and so if you want to fix it, it doesn't take much money, but you actually have to have a desire to do that. And commercial could be a big part of that uh, if, if the bureaucracy wanted to say, let's work to mission outcome instead of doing programs of record. When Willie Shelton took over as commander of Space Command, he noticed that ESC was going to spend $1.3 billion on their next generation, cut the budget by almost an order of magnitude. Uh, but, but, the budget, but the program he put, then put in, in, into place never was quite successful because the process of getting it fielded out through um, the Vandenberg infrastructure uh, just overwhelmed the program. So uh, here's an example of something we could easily do, something that's really important to Space Force, something that's really important to space commerce, 
and all of us need to take this on board and, and, and get it right. Great, thank you. Um, let me shift gears briefly. I uh, wanted to cover, uh, come back to one topic that just about everyone raised. Several of you noted the importance of a well-trained and highly incentivized acquisition workforce. What has worked and what hasn't in this area? And what recommendations do you have for assuring such a professional acquisition workforce going forward? Um, as you know, the Space Force has created a Space Training and Readiness Command, and they've also, again, obviously the, the Space Systems Command. What advice would you have for the folks leading those organizations as it relates to developing a, a competent, professional, highly motivated workforce? So, Chris, let me, let me jump in because you've asked sort of a military education question. And we have two very competent leaders uh, here in the group uh, uh, from the uniform, uniform military. And they have a unique problem they have to do when we staff um, with, with, all of us have, as managers, have a, a problem of always choosing the most competent uh, to be the leaders in a particular task. Um, Sending people to the schoolhouse and getting them a certificate does is an element perhaps of the problem, but it is no substitute for experience. And, and so the world that Tom Conroy spoke to, where I can grab a lieutenant colonel in the form of Jim Manon and have Jim Manon decide he's never going to be a flag and be an expert acquisition leader and train people under them and, and, and put together several program offices in a row that perform and have very little dependency on the schoolhouses speaks to the gap between sort of right educated and the right experience. And, and, and so we have to sort of say, um, successfully getting through command and golf does not make you an acquisition sorry. Uh, I'd like to contribute on this. Um, Go ahead, Tom. In my experience, we've, we've many of us, uh, for speaking for myself, grew up without the benefit of ever having gone to the schoolhouse on how to run an acquisition. I started in the late 60s uh, doing acquisitions in an R&D environment and kind of gradually grew into uh, major collection systems to be deployed overseas and, uh, and then into the space world. Uh, it was all the school of hard knocks and learning by doing and making mistakes along the way and not being severely punished, uh, but learning from those mistakes. Uh, to me, uh, what Jeff has said rings true. You, you need to be able to give people the opportunity to succeed. The schoolhouse may provide some insight into what tools and resources are available, but a focus on risk avoidance or on process over delivering mission that matters is is what has to change. Uh, in my time in the NRO in the uh, in the late two uh, late 1990s, uh, there was an organization called Operation Support Office, um, and it was it was focused on providing NRO capabilities to the military commands around the world. And and it, at that time, the military commands by and large did not know a great deal about the NRO, what it did, what it was capable of doing, how it operated, and so forth. Uh, that group was given some money to go out and do experiments, if you will, or develop small adaptations of uh, tools that would enable capabilities from the NRO to, made to be made available to the combatant commanders. And it was enormously successful, so much so that Congress and many in DOD wanted it to slow down and stop doing what it was doing because it was creating a demand for capabilities that were not in the palm. So it was upending the budget process, which is exactly where we started on all of this. I think all of our panel members have agreed that the budget flexibility is key to the success of this Space Force. But how, how, how dare you show value? <laughs> well, that's right. But there were a lot of lessons learned from that. And, I, and I'm, or let's say lessons to be learned from that. And I'm not sure that they were learned. I think uh, it's unclear that we've adapted the budget process to encourage that kind of entrepreneurial thinking, going back to Doug's observation about our differentiation on entrepreneurial behaviors. Uh, 
It's not sure that the budget analysts and the budgeteers like the idea of new requirements flowing in that have been proven on a small scale basis. Um, so getting that into the thinking of this new Space Force will be a very important attribute. Doug, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, so um, let me pile on a little bit to what uh, Tom said. Uh, you know, I, um, I grew up, uh, my first two assignments in the Air Force were at Air Force Laboratories, which was very, uh, very unusual. Uh, but I spent the first uh, nine years of my Air Force career at Air Force Laboratories. The only formal acquisition training I had was, uh, was a book that somebody threw, out to me, threw at me when I got to, to my first assignment and said, go read this. Um, and other than that, it was the School of Hard Knocks. But the, the great thing was, I was working on small acquisitions, five, $10 million acquisitions. The, the, if I screwed up, um, nothing big was, no, nobody was gonna die, nothing big was gonna happen. And the interesting thing is on the small acquisitions, you're not just the project engineer or the project officer or the program manager or the contracting officer or the financial officer, you're all of those things. Mm -hmm. you, you are all of those things. And so you learn the entire breadth of what it means to go ahead and be a program manager. I used to um, I used to marvel when I was at SMC when I my first program management tour there um, that there were so many program managers who didn't understand contracts better than the contracts officer who didn't understand finance better than the finance officer and if they didn't understand those things better they were at their mercy uh, to go ahead and and act um, and I always think you know the 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 analogy that I think of is the um, is uh, you know the captain of the, of a of a ship um, in the navy. He's gone through engineering and he's gone through guidance and navigation and he's gone through the bridge. He's been taken through his career um, as an ensign normally through all of the different pieces so that he can expertly guide the ship. And this is what has to happen with uh, folks: is they have to go ahead and exercise the breadth of acquisition. And that best is done through a career path that starts with small acquisitions and goes to large acquisitions. Hey, Doug, let me interrupt you just briefly. Sure. We, we have a question from a, a gentleman in one of our member companies who asks, uh, and I'll just quote the question here, accepting that people are key to the process, would you recommend reestablishing the space schoolhouse that blends ICAF, Defense Acquisition University, and practical lectures from folks like the panel to set the course for the future with leaders, Space SOS, Space Intermediate Service School, and Space War College, et cetera. So I, th I think those professional military education things are, are key to understanding space doctrine and strategy and, and the larger thing. But if we're talking about acquisition, I think that is mostly a on-the-job training kind of thing that you have to learn uh, with. Uh, again, you, you do need to know the basics. You need to understand the FAR. Um, but you need to learn it. And the, the key here to me, the, 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 the key here um, that I think underpins um, all of this um, is that you have to allow people to grow in a career that is 80% focused on that specialty and still have growth. You can't, you can't tell them, oh my God, um, we can't let you go back to another acquisition organization um, because you've already been to one. No, that's exactly what you wanna do. You want them there again. Um, and you want them to be able to grow. And that happens um, well for folk, some folks in uniform. It happens even better for some folks in civilian clothes. Um, the, the other piece of this that I think is, is, is really critical um, when, you, when you talk about that, um, that growth and that ability to, to learn um, is they've got to go ahead and have um, and have the ability to fail. Um, so you've got to give them the ability to own something and to fail um, a, a, along the way, because that's the only way we really uh, we really learn things is by failing at it. And as long as as long as they're surrounded by people um, who can help them, um, that's great. We don't allow that to happen anymore in the DoD. Today we have a program office. For example, if I go back to SMC and we look at the GPS or SIBRS program office, there's 800 people in that program office and 80% of them are contractors. Uh, we have not given the Lieutenant a responsibility that he can succeed at or not because he's never actually allowed to run things. We, the NRO has much smaller program offices where people are given responsibilities. They're in charge of a system. They learn by doing and they're allowed to fail. Uh, and you, we have to do that with our space acquirers, whether it's a GS9 
or a lieutenant, a GS-12 or a captain, a GS-14 or a major or lieutenant colonel. We've got to make sure that they are the ones responsible, not, not allow them to have 100 seaters around them to go ahead and, uh, and prevent them from learning. And I, and I think we're way too dependent on the Air Force side on those contract supports. Now, being now a consultant, I'm really digging my own grave. But, um, but the, fact of the, matter, the fact of the matter is, is that we, we need folks who are held responsible and you can't hold them responsible when they're one of a hundred. That's it. Chris? Yes, please. You know, I, I think we have the opportunity to take a step back. Instead, you know, I, I listened to the question that um, you asked, um, Doug, and I guess um, my first reaction is, well, let's throw out all this term. You know, I really don't care what you call these things. But if you go back and you look at what is it that's needed to get that small talented team, because remember, that's what I said is the key, the small talented team. And, and just basic, back to basics, there's education, there's training, and there's experience. And, and I think it's, it's thinking about all of those. And my, my initial reaction is I, I think about if I were sitting down there, you know, as Jay Raymond or his, uh, uh, or JT Thompson and said, okay, clean sheet of paper. Um, I think um, I would value, as Doug says, the, the experience is most important. I mean, I shared with you all as we prepped for this yesterday that the best thing that Ron Kadish ever did for me when he was in the Missile Defense Agency was to force me to stay there for five years as the uh, Airborne Laser Program Director because at about the beginning of the fourth year, I started to learn how to live with my own mistakes because I didn't have the, uh, you know, okay, I put my two or three year term in and I'm out and I could blame the guy before me for the decisions. So there is a lot to be said for experience. You cannot learn this trade without experience. Training, all of the mechanics as, um, you know, we've talked about, which is what DAU used to teach, I know they've gotten a little bit better at this, but understanding the FAR, understanding that, I think a lot of that should be handled as just-in-time training. It doesn't do any good to train somebody about the rules of a source selection, and then they don't do a source selection for six or seven years. So, you know, training is something that should be done uh, just in time. The NRO had a really good approach to doing that. And then finally, on the education side, this is where we have to think our way through as to what is important about space systems that we need our acquisition folks to understand. And I think Doug got it. And this is what the uniformed people bring to acquisition. Otherwise, it is understanding of, of doctrine, of tactics. And the way that uh, I thought Space Command had that right for a short time and they eliminated it was that our young officers went to Space 101 or I think was what was it called uh, something like that and 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 so they were there with the the new operational lieutenants learning all about space doctrine but I in my view as an acquisition professional um, in the space business that is the lower of three pieces of this preparation to be a professional. Because I think that these small teams that I talked about have to have representation of space operators. We can't count on those guys to be doing those tough acquisition decisions, but if you're gonna have the diversity of thought and the ability to make decisions quickly, you need somebody who's been there, done that in the room. But you can't turn to that guy who's been there, done that, and say, okay, now structure this uh, design review or uh, determine whether this technology is mature enough or what are the clauses I need in this contract to be, you know, so, so you have to first recognize education, training, and experience, and, and they are in reverse order, as I just said them. And then secondly, you have to look at how you structure your team to ensure you in incorporate the diversity of experience that's needed to have that small agile team. 
So I would not even start with, okay, I need a air war, a space war college. Those are, in fact, when I was last in the Air Force, we were even examining whether we needed to have that type of tiered approach uh, for the Air Force at large, because guess what? Little secret, the air side struggles with this um, balance between education time lost to education versus experience, even in the operational world. So start with a clean sheet. Experience is most critical, but there is a need to have that what I would consider just in time training. And then finally, you do need to have foundational understanding of what's important in terms of the mission. And that I think comes from the education. Well, thank you. Um, I wanna make sure we, uh, we keep a little time for you all to provide some wrap up comments if you'd like. Uh, I wanna highlight a couple things in the, uh, in the association's paper and get you to react to these. Um, of the many recommendations that uh, were included in the report, there are two I want to focus on, and very briefly, um, one was create deeper government industry partnerships. It says industry plays an essential role in generating acquisition speed and agility, but it can't do it alone. The government must align its strengths with industry, enhance trust and accountability to improve the partnership, and then secondly, align incentives across the government industry program teams. Shared incentives aligned across the government, uh, including program managers, contracts and security officers, FFRDCs, CETA contractors, and the industry team are fundamental to ensure the entire program team is focused and performing to achieve a successful outcome. Do you have recommendations on, on, uh, on how this closer collaboration, this closer integration between uh, the government and industry can be accomplished? It's one of the central reasons for the association in the first place, but would love to hear some thoughts on that. Uh, Doug, you, you raised your hand. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, this is, um, I think, one of the key things that, uh, that you have right in the report there, there Chris. Uh, you know. Um, it's funny as you go through acquisition. Sometimes you're, sometimes you're taught that you know industry is the the enemy. Uh, they're not. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, there are there are there there can be evil people out there. But the, in general, most people want to do the right things. Um, but figuring out how to bring those folks together is critical. And I'll tell you one of the tools that I really think the space force can really um, learn from, and it goes right to what we were all just talking about what Ellen was talking about and Tom was talking about and I was talking about and people um, is education with industry. Uh, I mean, going ahead and breaking down this mysterious barrier um, that exists between folks on the acquisition side of the force and folks in industry is so key to go ahead and getting that communication right. And education with industry is the cheapest, easiest way to go ahead and break down that barrier. And I mean, you you learn an incredible amount if, with the right kind of education with industry experiences. So I think that is um, of the first question you asked. I'll, I'll just um, uh, reserve myself to that. I think the education with industry program needs to be expanded for the Space Force. I think all of our um, lieutenants and captains, instead of uh, Ellen was talking about, you know, do we really need a squadron officer school? Uh, nope, we don't, or a space, a space officer school. Let's call it an SOS space officer school. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that we do, but if, but if we do need one school, and it's maybe in one of your first three assignments, if you're gonna be an acquisition guy, you ought to have an experience with industry. It's a great place to learn your trade and to understand what industry's perspective is on these kind of things. So I, I would highly endorse that, and I'll let others speak after them. After can, can, can I can I just add to that and, and provide a, a, an adjunct uh, avenue that, that closely relates to that uh, with any ISAG uh, support to to uh, uh, Jay Raymond? We we discovered that the, the the command is looking at what I would call flexible accessions. That is to say, take the uh, Air Force Medical Corps example. And instead of hiring everybody in as a lieutenant, if, if you need somebody that's been through medical school, hire them in as a major. Uh, if you need, uh, and in this case, I can speak personally to it because my son-in-law enjoyed this program, uh, where the medical corps determined that because of all the uh, uh, hospital administration issues that they were, that they were encountering with TRICARE, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, that they needed some MBAs. So they hired them. 
they, they commissioned my son-in-law and others to come in as first lieutenants and said, his third assignment was education with industry. Went to work with a, with a, uh, with a drug company to understand how they were uh, uh, taking on the discipline of managing uh, da uh, dangerous drugs. So, so I, I agree with you, Doug. I, I, I think there has to be some give and take uh, between uh, industry and, and, and the military uh, to, to leverage what you learn on both sides of the contract. And, and I, th I think that would be that would be a, a, a really good uh, initiative for, for the Space Force to, to pursue. Ellen, Ellen, did you have a comment? I, I did. Uh, I'm taking a, a very different tack on this. I, I alluded to this in my, my opening uh, discussion, and, and that is um, in the contract structure. You know, we, we tend at times in our um, acquisitions, and I, I saw this on a, a couple of programs that totally destroyed it, that we end up using this contract to establish what in, becomes an adversarial relationship because of the way the contract is structured, because of the things we put in there. And, and you walk into the program office, and you've got a team there that's trying to play I gotcha with the contractor, as opposed to a contract in which it's a roll up their sleeves, we're in this together. I remember one of the first conversations I had with Len Kwiatkowski when we were talking about advanced DHF and we were getting into a rebaselining and, and he came in to talk to me about it and you know, it was very much this, well, we can't show you what we're doing yet because I haven't gotten it approved through my, you know, my leadership. And, and I looked at him and I said, look, Len, I can't succeed if you don't succeed. So, we have to go about this together. We can't look at this as you throwing things over the fence to me. And so that's why I highlighted the importance of having a Space Force head of contracting authority so that you can uh, continue to comply with all the rules and regulations that, that the Space Force will have to, but structure contracts so that they are a cooperative and a collaborative mechanism not an adversarial check the checker approach because it's from the beginning and i saw this work very effectively at the nro where we had long-term contracts in which um, our contractors were directly involved in building those architectures jeff i'm sure you're probably familiar with that in building that we have to be able to do that within the contracting structure in addition to this, what I call exchange of hostages or, you know, between so that we understand each other. But if we don't structure contracts so that this is a team sport as opposed to a watch the check the checker, everything else is, um, is just going to go out the door. Agreed. Well, we've got time for a, a, a lightning round of comments. No questions, but... Uh, uh, Ellen, if you'd like to start us off with some just quick summary comments, we, we have time for maybe a minute, minute and a half uh, for each of you before we have to shut down. And let me say before you do, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, this has been outstanding. Uh, I, frankly, I think this ought to be uh, must-see TV for, uh, for everybody in the Space Force and, and elsewhere. This is uh, really useful. So thank you for your time. Really appreciate your participation. And Ellen, uh, why don't you start off with a, a wrap-up for us? Yeah, I, you know, thanks, Chris, for organizing this. And there was some really good uh, discussion. And I got some good insights from listening to, to, to everybody else. But I, you know, I guess I just circle back with, you know, the key to success in acquisition from my experience is to make sure that the people, decision makers have the authority to make the decisions so that they aren't, the, and that they have um, a small team that's talented so they can make good decisions and they have the resources they need to make it happen. And, and if, as long as we keep those three things in mind as we look at how we structure this, then I think uh, we will be successful. It's easy to say those three things. It's a lot harder uh, to make them a reality. But again, thanks uh, for letting me participate. And thanks for all of those of you who have um, uh, uh, participated as the audience. Uh, it, it, it's warm, heartwarming to see there are so many people that are interested in this topic. Exactly. Jeff, over to you. 
Yeah, we have an acquisition party and all these people show up to attend. Uh, and again, thanks to everybody who contributed to Chris and Mark as they put together uh, the document in order to make the document stronger so we could uh, opine about it. Uh, in the last conversation, we talked about how important this is as a team sport. It's a team sport with all the elements coming together and it's intra and extra government. Uh, we're aligning the incentives around mission. Uh, as a nuance, we did not talk a lot about uh, award fee contracts versus incentive contracts. Uh, early, in my, early in my career, I had two parallel programs, uh, one that was Air Force centered, one was NRO centered, uh, but one was really structured on incentive fee. And I could see that the contractor had this bias to earn the fee at the expense of making the system work. And I saw it later uh, towards the end of my career where a contractor says, look, that's not a requirement. You know, actually making the system perform is not a deliverable. Uh, I've racked and stacked. So the mistake in the contract was actually uh, influencing the incentives and the ability to do a team sport. Um, everybody has said it on the panel today. Uh, this is all about timely, making the right decision in a timely manner, living with the decisions, getting it mostly right. Uh, we know how to go be smart space practitioners, including the operators, having a reasonable requirements process. Doug was correct to throw the KPPs under the rug. Um, and uh, the JROC has turned out to be a failed experience if you're going to talk about agile acquisition. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Doug, over to you. Uh, sure, Chris. You know, I just happened to be scanning the participant list uh, while uh, while we were looking there. Um, we've got uh, a bunch of folks uh, who are listening who could just as uh, quickly um, contribute to this uh, discussion as well. And and it would be great if we could all get into a room together at some point. But let me let me again, like Ellen did, let me let me go back to where I began. Um, this this is so important to get right, um, and you can't just throw a whole bunch of ideas on the table and expect to and expect to get it right. I think it I think getting this right comes from truly studying the lessons of history and the lessons of organizations that exist today, um, and and studying them to learn what worked and what didn't work. Um, I, I I remember I remember when we canceled um, FIA. Um, uh, folks at the NRO uh, um, were of the mind that we learned everything we could learn just by canceling it. And we shouldn't uh, go back and study it, and that was the wrong, the wrong answer. We needed to study it. Um, but, but I, I think if we, if we, and I'll and I'll talk to the folks uh, on the line who are from from Congress and the news and um, and from the military. If we really want to go ahead and do, do best at space acquisition, and if we all believe, and I think we all do, that the folks who do this the best in the nation today. Um, are the NRO. Let's go study the qualities that make that a successful organization, knowing that not every one of them is going to fit within a military structure. That's very clear. But how do we go ahead and get the same kind of same kind of results um, that we have there? Because if we could if we could get as good as that, uh, we would be in damn good shape um, as we as we move forward. And I, I think that is a, a key issue. That we have to be willing to go ahead and uh, and and look at uh, and adopt new ways of thinking about this. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for your participation, Doug. Uh, Don Hard, please. Yes. Well, let me echo everybody in in terms of thanks. I think this was a, a very helpful for me uh, uh, forum to to get a little better understanding. Uh, my only emphasis would again be to ensure that as we go forward, that that there's a uh, equal agility across all stakeholders, processes, parts, pieces, everything. We've all got to move together at the same speed. Uh, and I would also just add, and back to a comment I, I think uh, that was made earlier, if we think that we should have invested in something several years ago, and that was the best time to do it, maybe today's the second best time to do it. If we think we should have solved the problem several years ago, and, and now it's time to do it, yes, it is time to do it. To me, that's what agility is all about. It's the ability to address issues now instead of waiting or instead of ruining the day that you didn't address them. So I hope that we can achieve a more agile organization as we go forward. Well put, Tom. Um, my wrap up would be that this, you got a lot of expertise on this, uh, on this panel and a lot of um, uh, wounds from the fights over the years. Uh, glad to be a part of it. Uh, we also have some great uh, experts out in the participant world. Uh, 
But I would wrap up by saying that I think the, uh, one of the things that the NSSA report uh, got particularly right was the relentless focus on the mission. Uh, too often we've been sidetracked by making sure that our process is being adhered to and we're doing everything's according, everything according to the book. If everybody was aligned towards the mission, I think a lot of the problems we've encountered uh, over the years would have gone away. Secondly, and a part, a very much a contributing part to that is the people, making sure that they are incentivized and developed and prepared to be relentlessly focused on the mission and that process is only a tool to accomplish the mission, not an, an end in itself. And finally, I think uh, ability to make the case and build trust with the Congress is going to be absolutely crucial in the future for the uh, U.S. Space Force. Um, that's, that's a semi, it's a very independent organization, and they can help or hurt us, and uh, getting it right with them will, will make the difference for years to come. Thanks. Thanks again for being a part of this. Well, thank, thank you to all the participants, uh, and uh, thank you to those who have viewed this uh, online. Um, on behalf of the association, I want to say uh, thank you for your time and your expertise. Uh, we at the association uh, firmly believe that uh, uh, we need to increase the, the coordination, the partnership between government and industry. For those uh, on the uh, viewing this who are members of the association, we thank you for your membership. Uh, for board of a director, our board of advisor members, all of our panelists today, we thank you for your your time and energy on that. And for those that are interested in getting uh, greater information about the association and or joining the association, uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, Steve Jakes, the executive director, or myself or others. But we really appreciate your time. And uh, this has been a very worthwhile conversation. So on behalf of the association, thanks to all involved and we'll be out here. Look forward to the next event. Thanks a lot.